Coming up on this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We'll examine how multiple stakeholders are working together to help support and advance the sustainability of the beef industry. Plus, we'll share some simple yet preventative steps to help keep stalker cattle healthy. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Hi, everybody, and welcome to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Russell Nemitz. Well, as the voice of the cattle industry in Washington, D.C., the National Cattlemen's Beef Association makes a difference for cattle producers. And we've got an update on what's happening in our nation's capital in this week's Beltway Beef Spotlight. Well, thanks, Russell. Summertime is always busy in Washington, D.C. as we look towards a slew of looming deadlines at the end of September. That's always when we see the end of government funding and the need for a new spending bill here in Washington. But this year, it's also when we're expecting the expiring farm bill to need reauthorization. Whether that be through a finished farm bill, as a lot of, a lot of us are hoping for, or an extension of the existing farm bill, while folks in Washington fight over the details of what the next one might look like, it's a critical time in Washington, D.C. for us to be putting our input into the conversation. We're also looking at a slew of regulations from various federal agencies, whether that be USDA in the form of rulemakings on traceability and product of the United States labeling, or dangerous regulations coming out of the Department of Interior on various endangered species, or a BLM conservation planning rule that could absolutely upend grazing in the West for producers in 14 Western states, or the EPA still trying to figure out what to do with waters of the United States in the wake of a historic Supreme Court decision that's going to dramatically curtail what they can do with that rulemaking. All of these issues are going to be discussed at our upcoming summer business meeting in San Diego next week. It's a critical opportunity for producers and leaders from across the country and across the industry to come together and discuss where we're at in the policy process, what these regulations and rules might do to impact the cattle industry, and what we can do as an industry to push back on them, to educate about them, and to make sure those federal policies go in the right direction for our industry. It's a crucial opportunity for all of us to compare notes, gather ourselves, and push back into these fights to make sure we get the best out of Washington and keep them out of our business as best we can. We look forward to seeing all of you in San Diego next week. We're excited to get back into this grassroots policy process so we can get back to Washington and back to advancing the cattle industry and protecting its interests in our nation's capital. Thanks and see you all next week. Now you can help in the fight for common sense, federal policies and against efforts that threaten the future of the beef cattle industry by becoming an NCBA member. And it's easy to do so. Just call 866-233-3872 or visit the website ncba.org. By the way, be sure to use the code C2C for a special membership offer for our viewers. You know, cattle producers face all kinds of challenges when it comes to protecting the environment, but they all have a common goal, and that's leaving the land better than how they found it. We asked cattlemen and cattle women from across the country to share their thoughts on sustainability and what it means to them. Sustainability is the most important thing. I, I don't, you know, it's a buzzword to some people, but at the end of the day, no ranch is going to be profitable that's not sustainable, right? So, I mean, we're all working to, to be sustainable just, just to survive. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. You know, some of the sustainability that everybody is, is kind of preaching and throwing around out there, stuff we're already doing. Sustainability in the beef industry is definitely one of those buzzwords. It definitely pricks everybody's ears. And I truly believe there is nobody more sustainable than the agricultural industry. We love our planet, we love our earth, and we would not be able to do what we do without taking care of it. So sustainability, while it's a great buzzword, it's also something that's very valuable to us as producers. Sustainability is, is a unique term, and, and uh, to me, it's making every day better for tomorrow. You know, we're fifth, sixth, seventh generation, 
we're doing things different, but you know, we truly are the best stewards of the land, you know, as producers. We value that land, we value the natural resources, we value everything moving forward. And we have to continue to do that as beef producers. And we can do a better job. You know, even myself, we can do a better job of that. If we don't talk about sustainability and maintain our sustainability and what we do from an environmental structure to an economic structure, we can't live and survive. So I think talking about sustainability and what we do and have done in years past and what we continue to do today and couple that with the environmental stewardship awards that we work towards and give every year, it's, I mean, it's a given. It's, it's something that's a must. We need to show that beef cattle are extremely important in being able to sustain our environment, the grasses on the grounds, the trees that are there, and we are an overall product, the beef are an overall product, which is you know, keeping the ground healthy, but also keeping people healthy. We've been sustainable for generations, and I think we're getting more sustainable just with research and the huge strides in just soil health and, and uh, animal health and, and being more efficient with, with raising animals and, and pounds of beef per animal. And, and um, I think we're more efficient than we've ever been, more sustainable than we've ever been, and it's, it's only going to get better from here. It's something that we've got a great story to tell. You know, our, our native grasslands is where we do a good job of sequestering carbon. And, and so many of our producers are, are people like myself that operations have been in place and existing for 100 years. You, you don't stay on the land for over 100 years without being sustainable. But at the same time, it, it's great that we have an educational component at NCBA to work on these sustainability issues to help us continue to be even better at what we do. Now the only real way we're going to advance the sustainability of the beef cattle industry is through collaboration, education, and the development of best practices. Cattlemen to Cattlemen reporter Brian Baxter has more on how industry stakeholders are coming together to help improve the sustainability of U.S. beef. The members of the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, known as USRSB, held their 2023 General Assembly in Boise, Idaho. Nearly 200 people gathered for the annual meeting, which brings together all sectors of the U.S. beef supply chain, from the ranch to the beef consumer. The U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef is an absolutely excellent organization that is truly a round table. In other words, we have people from every sector of the beef value chain involved. It's really pretty exciting because producers are um, a tremendous part of this organization, but we also have retailers and packers, processors, feed yard owners and operators, and then also civil society. We figured to involve them in the conversation is the way to make sure that we're on the right track and able to meet what their concerns are. The USRSB General Assembly is a great opportunity one, to engage, to understand where the industry is going, but it's, we are true, a true round table. So you get to hear from all sectors of the industry of where they're going, what they're wanting to do, what are those goals and actions, and how we work together up and down that value chain. The assembly is a great opportunity for producers to engage, to understand where they're going, at the same time be able to share where they are in this process of sustainability. In the last eight years, as producers, we've seen this conversation about sustainability and environmental awareness become state of the art. It is the leading question of our industry at this time in our period. And I think the U.S. Roundtable and its sister organizations and state affiliates have proven that they're there fighting for us, making sure that our message gets out, that positive message about the beef that we produce and the ways we go about producing it, caring for the land, caring for the communities. There's no bigger issue right now than this one and their engagement is essential. Their voices must be heard. Working together, USRSB members have set goals for improvement in areas such as greenhouse gas emissions, the use of land and water, animal health, and worker safety. The group welcomes anyone who has an interest in ensuring the sustainability of U.S. beef. So the retail sector, we are the key interface with customers regarding beef. So we're able to bring that perspective in terms of what we're hearing from our customers to the entire sector. We're also able to bring what we're hearing from our investors, from the NGO partners that we have, and we're able to share what we're hearing, how we're interacting with the entire sector as well. 
What we're interested in as part of the Nature Conservancy is also very much in line with what the producers want. We want folks to have a grazing management plan. We want them to con be concerned about water and you know carbon and all of those things that people think are traditional environmental issues, and that's very true. But if we don't have those ranchers out on the landscape, then we don't have grass for all of the species that we care about. So it's super important that we keep those ranchers on the landscape. So from that perspective, we have, we have a ton in common. I'd like to continue on the work that's been done so far and keep it going in a positive way. Maybe right now we've, we've made some goals, we got some great ambitions. Now the practical side of things is to get things done. And so we got to make sure that we continue the process forward, but we do it in a practical way that's good for the entire beef supply chain. In addition to updates on research results and on the progress being made toward achieving beef sustainability goals, the General Assembly also included a tour with the members visiting a feedlot as well as the J.R. Simplot French Fry Processing Plant. The tours I've been on with the General Assembly, they provide a lot of insight on segments of the cattle industry that most people don't have the opportunity to see. Very rarely does a uh, producer, particularly in Alabama, have the opportunity to go see a feed yard and a processing plant and see the rest of the segments that are involved in our industry. Producers involved with USRSB say achieving sustainability goals is important to meeting consumer demand. However, for the cow-calf sector, meeting those goals can be achieved with simple steps such as implementing a grazing management plan and getting certified through the Beef Quality Assurance Program. We can take this step to be a part of the solution and the positive narrative on sustainable beef production. So getting BQA certified and then taking that next step and writing down a grazing management plan. I mean, if you do those two things as a producer, you're 90% there as far as what the U.S. Roundtable has identified as positive contributions you can make towards sustainable beef production. Reporting from Idaho, I'm Brian Baxter for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. You can follow the work of the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef at their website, usrsb.org. And be sure to check out beefresearch.org for the very latest updates on the sustainability efforts that NCBA is undertaking as a contractor to the beef checkoff. Still ahead here on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll take a look at the findings from the 2022 National Beef Quality Audit and explain the value of this important data to cattle producers. It's almost time for this week's Will of Watch. Matt Makins here. What I've got for you today is going to be the risks that El Nino may bring, whether that be temperature or precipitation extremes on one side or the other. We'll see you in just a bit. The fact is the animal activists hate us. They don't like the fact that we raise cattle and they definitely don't like people eating beef or meat of any kind. And we know that based upon their actions and on the many choice things that they've said about us over the years. These are individuals that we can't reason with, we can't negotiate with, and we definitely can't compromise with. The only approach to dealing with these groups is to fight and to punch hard when we do fight. And that's exactly what NCBA is doing. These organizations are working on the farm bill, just like we are. They have an agenda, and that agenda is not pro-agriculture. One of those topics, of course, is the OFF Act, something that you've heard us talk about quite a bit. The OFF Act would completely restructure the checkoff and make it ineffective. And that's exactly what the animal activists want. They know that in order to come after us and be successful in their agenda, they have to make life harder on us. The checkoff has a track record of success in building demand. That is people eating beef, something these animal activist groups do not want to see. That's why they've targeted the OFF Act, and that's why they're engaging in the Farm Bill, and they have built a coalition. A coalition where one of the leaders is 
the ASPCA. A lot of times when we talk about animal activist groups, you hear us talk about HSUS or PETA. Everybody knows that PETA is an extremist group, but ASPCA, all you have to do is just turn on the television and see their ads, $19 a month to help the dogs and cats. But in reality, less than 3% of their budget goes to any local pet shelter. The rest of that money goes towards their extremist agenda, and that agenda is anti-agriculture, anti-livestock, and anti-cattle producer. So we are punching back to make sure that we expose ASPCA for the true frauds that they are, and that we ensure that this farm bill is focused on programs that protect us, support us, and give us opportunities, not as a platform for the animal activist agenda. So to stay up to date on all of our activities on the Farm Bill, especially in our fight against the animal activists, go to our website, ncba.org. And it's not too late to register to come to Summer Business Meeting in San Diego, where all of these discussions will be had and we'll give updates on all of NCBA's fights on your behalf. Weeds will rob me of my investments. The weeds are not palatable to the cows. They will not eat them. Or if they do eat them, some of them may be toxic. So there's a return on investment by allowing there to be more grass available to be grazed by the cattle. Elcon 24 is marching onward to Orlando, January 31st to February 2nd, 2024. Have your say in the future of the industry, network with fellow producers, or connect with friendly faces. Plus, the NCBA trade show will be on site with over 385,000 square feet of the latest and greatest in the cattle business to help your operation stay competitive and sustainable. Learn more at convention.ncba.org. Well-producing a quality product is absolutely essential to the long-term success of the beef kettle industry. Quality, of course, drives consumer satisfaction, which puts more money into producers' pockets. But how do we know we're making the right decisions as an industry to continue to deliver the best beef product possible? Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Kate Maher has a look at the National Beef Quality Audit and what its findings mean to the industry. Every five years, the National Beef Quality Audit brings together a wide range of beef industry stakeholders for a research and data collection effort. Funded by the Beef Checkoff, the NBQA provides an assessment of the state of the beef industry, identifies current challenges, and acknowledges what progress has been made in the effort to improve beef quality. The benefit of the National Beef Quality Audit is we have a snapshot in time every five years that the industry can see where it's, where it's moving, what it's making gains, and where it needs to continue to, to make improvements. The National Beef Quality Audit is an amazing resource for the industry. I think what it really does is it brings the whole supply chain together um, so we can understand needs, challenges, wants, and expectations across the supply chain. It is really important to understand what are the problems with the product that we're manufacturing before we can go upstream and try and figure out precautionary measures that we can implement to prevent those problems from existing in the first place. Every time we make a change that eliminates or reduces the frequency of one of those problems, we elevate consumer demand because the next consumer that buys that product is now going to have a more desirable experience with the product rather than a negative experience with the product. Based on individual interviews with stakeholders from across the beef industry, as well as research conducted in processing plants, the findings from the latest NBQA indicate that the U.S. beef industry continues to provide a high-quality product to consumers. 
One of the great things from this beef quality audit is more cattle are grade and prime and choice than ever before. If we go back in time and look at the results of these beef quality audits, um, the way that we've improved the quality grade of these cattle has been unbelievable. We wouldn't have expected it years ago, but we've been able to do so much through genetic selection, knowing that carcass traits are highly heritable traits. And we can select for them and we manage cattle better than ever before. And the result is really high grade in cattle. We've got a lot of them today. We're producing a product that consumers want. We know that it continues to be at the highest prices, but the fact that we reached an all-time high of prime and choice is amazing, and I think that's something that we should really be excited about. I think one of the things that we can celebrate is the beef image uh, is really good. So consumers see beef as a, a high quality product. They, they trust cattle producers, and I think that's something that we can capitalize on. Although the National Beef Quality Audit shows that the industry has made some great progress on past key areas of focus, it also sheds light on issues that need attention, especially in the area of bruising. I think there's still some work to be done in terms of our handling practices as cattle change in size and shape. One of the big things we talk about is bruises, and so just trying to eliminate those things so that we don't lose money anywhere. The incidents are not real high in the industry, but we should not be trending in that direction. I think we need the, the processes, the facilities, the equipment, including in transportation, to make sure that we're eliminating these bruises in cattle. There's no reason for us to be taking that weight. The National Beef Quality Audit is closely linked to the Beef Quality Assurance Program and holds significant importance in supporting its objectives. Many of the BQA guidelines and best practices are built from research provided by the audit. Educational programs are based off the National Beef Quality Audit because now you have actual data that you can use when you're training people uh, that are cattle producers. The audit provides a piece of the science that we use in beef quality assurance to enhance our educational efforts. So we're, we're constantly revisiting that. What do we need to be focusing on? We don't forget about the past. We, we want to keep that, but we're adding to it and enhancing it. BQA is the industry's program. It's, I like us as an industry owning this program and moving it forward. And data from the beef quality audit just goes to support that and enhance that so we're always getting better as an industry. One of the hallmarks of the original BQA training is that injection site triangle, where to give injections, and we saw the results of that training, I think, in this audit where we had almost no injection site lesions, particularly on the market cow and bull side of things. I mean, I think that's something that we can definitely hang our hats on. The valuable insights, benchmarks, and data-driven information provided by the National Beef Quality Audit helps producers make the right production adjustments that will continue to increase the value of their product. I can't stress enough how important that this study is for the beef cattle industry. We're creating a timeline of data that allows us to understand more adequately what things we're making progress in and what things we're not making progress in so we can do a better job of satisfying customers and adding value back to the system. The more knowledge that cattle producers have, the more informed they can be as far as selection, production, whatever it may be, uh, and make them, I think, a better all-around cattle person. Reporting from Denver, Colorado, I'm Kate Maher for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Cattlemen to Cattlemen recently put together a special episode focused on the National Beef Quality Audit with experts' insights into the latest findings and what they mean to your operation. If you missed that episode, you can visit our YouTube page and see the episode for yourself. Also, if you'd like to view all of the resources produced on the NBQA or read a summary of the audit, you can find those materials on the website bqa.org. Still to come here on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, you'll see how a comprehensive herd health program is in fact making a difference for an Oklahoma stalker operation. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Did you know you can get reimbursed for attending cattle industry educational events? The Rancher Resilience Grant helps cattle producers attend valuable programs such as Cattlemen's College and Stockmanship and Stewardship training sessions. Local, state, and national events qualify for the grant and successful applicants can receive money back to help cover registration fees and hotel expenses. To apply for the Rancher Resilience Grant, go to ncba.org and click on the Producer tab. 
Time now for Weather Watch, brought to you by Ag Risk Advisors and WSR Insurance. Here's this week's Weather Watch. Matt Makins here. I hope it finds you doing well. Last time we chatted about El Nino kind of creating some, some wet regimes in some areas, plus this extreme heat. This time, since we were kind of on the theme of extremes, let's continue that. So what kind of risks does moving into an El Nino pattern bring to the country, bring to our regions in terms of precipitation? Maybe that means flooding or temperatures. Maybe that means excessive heat or cold, depending on the case. So let's talk about that and what's happening. We do have the El Nino region right here with the black boxes. Again, we're looking at ocean conditions. When the ocean conditions in those boxes are hotter than average, which they are now, you have a developing El Nino and a persistent El Nino. But you have to have the atmosphere respond to that. And so far, we've seen some hints of the atmosphere behaving El Nino, but other hints where it hasn't been. So they're not quite talking together yet, the atmosphere in the ocean, that is. The ocean is firmly in that El Nino pattern. We're just waiting on the atmosphere to behave like it. Part of the factor here is how much cold ocean we have just off in North America, off to the west coast there. And that's going to be a factor in the forecast. And again, we're talking about our engine, our atmospheric weather engine, our climate engine, if you will. So if you're applying pressure in some areas and getting that combustion, that spark, that burst of energy, you're compensating it somewhere else in the engine. And that's what's going to happen as we go forward. So with an El Nino, you're punching the atmosphere with storminess uh, and weather, and then somewhere else you're starting to dry things out. So let's see how that applies in terms of some of the extremes. These are going to be for fall temperature extremes. Blue means cold. So we're looking at more often than not cooler extremes for the central plains in the west with an El Nino during fall. Now moisture wise, we can see a surplus of water, increased risks of flooding throughout the Rockies, down through Texas. And then we compensate with that engine by drying things out for the Pacific Northwest and the Northern Plains. What about the winter? In the winter, you start to increase the risks of warmth or warm extremes across the northern tier of states. You compensate that with colder than normal conditions across the south. With moisture, we usually see the heaviest precip across the south in winter and driest extremes to the north. So those are some of the extreme conditions we may see as we develop this El Nino, get the atmosphere responding to it as we get into fall and winter. Look for temperature and precipitation extremes depending on where you are. And of course, we'll keep you updated on this as we go throughout the months ahead right here on C2C during the Weather Watch. Weather Watch is brought to you by Ag Risk Advisors, with you no matter the weather. And by WSR Insurance, providing insurance solutions for more than a century. Visit their websites for more details. Well, there's no question that stalker operators have a challenging task. The calves they work with are no longer beside a cow. They're not quite ready to head to a feed yard and they often face a variety of health challenges as they continue to grow. However, to be successful, a stalker operator needs a strong focus on the care of those calves. Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Brad Bulla takes us to Oklahoma now to learn more about some of the key steps in a stalker cattle health program. It's a misty morning at Shiro Ranch in eastern Oklahoma, and the cattle are gathering for breakfast. The Shiros raise stalker cattle, buying calves from a variety of places. We're purchasing not only high risk from the standpoint of coming off multiple ranches and through a sale barn, but we also purchase very light cattle. So we're purchasing a lot of 350 pound cattle to start with. What we're trying to do as a stalker operation is to get them into the very best herd health program so that when they go to the feedlot and those feedlot cattle are received up there, that they're on a plane of nutrition and health that they are very successful in the next phase of the industry. To be successful raising co-mingled, lighter weight calves, the Shiros have established a strong set of health protocols that begin as soon as the animals arrive at the ranch. We're trying to do a really good job on the front end when we receive these cattle so that they don't get sick. 
Uh, there's never a good outcome when you have a herd of cattle that gets sick on you. When we receive those cattle, handle them with the very best quality BQA protocols, but also when the, we process these animals and, and uh, put them through a chute and give them a vaccine program, uh, worm these cattle out, get them cleaned up, we want them to have the best chance of getting started on feeds quickly. The Cheryl Ranch does a great job incorporating these technologies into their management practices to help increase their margins as well as set up that calf to be successful at the next uh, phase after it leaves the ranch. Another technology to help um, improve margins within stalker operations is a good vaccine product. Merck Animal Health has Bovillus Vista Once. It's a combination product. Another key to keeping cattle healthy and growing is an effective program to knock out internal parasites. While we have great grass, lush grass, we have 50 inches of rain, when we have that much moisture, parasites are always an issue. So keeping the parasites off the grass and out of our animals is very, very important. We're a safeguard user. We use safeguards uh, for not only the economy of the cost, but we have, through the years, realized that it is actually the number one product out there to make sure that the animals are rid of all the internal parasites that are coming in uh, with them on our operation. When we deworm cattle, shoot side with a drench like Safeguard, uh, we're really doing two different things here. The first thing is to get rid of the parasites out of the animal, which allows that animal to reach its genetic potential. The second thing that it really does is when these animals go out to start grazing, they're not shedding eggs. And so we're reducing the number of parasites that are on the pasture. Deworming cattle can also be done without sending them through a chute by using feed and mineral forms of safeguard. With dewormers, it's important to routinely do fecal testing to determine if the treatment is delivering results. So doing a fecal egg test is a great way to monitor the parasite burden on these cattle. Um, due to the, the changes in uh, the parasites on pasture. We'll do fecal samples uh, while the cattle are here. If we see, begin to see a rise in uh, uh, fecal egg count uh, of the parasites, we will immediately put a safeguard in the feed. And so we'll worm those animals out without ever having to bring them through the chute. We do not want to go through the chute again. And uh, uh, while uh, you know there are some effective uh, injectable wormers, we want to do it easily and the most cost-effective way. Producers can request a free fecal test at the website safeguardworks.com. Another strategy the Shiro's use is adding a growth implant to their calves. We have always used an implant program here on the ranch. Uh, we believe strongly in it. Uh, we see the scientific data that drives us for the use of vaccines and for implants. It puts money in the pocket of the producer. It gets these cattle uh, moving in the direction that we want them to do a, a really quality herd health program. On our operation, we're looking for cattle to be gaining between a pound and a half and two pounds a day. That implant allows us to get started uh, at that high level very quickly. When the stalker operator makes a decision to use a Revel RG, they can expect about a 15 to 20% improvement in daily gain. So for example, if they're grazing for about 150 days and expecting a two pound a day gain, when, using, when utilizing a Revel RG, they can expect about a 30 pound increase in weight coming off grass. Not only does Merck Animal Health have the products to create a comprehensive cattle health program, they also have an expert team to help when needed. Our Merck reps have helped us not only through uh, doing fecal egg counts, but when we have health issues with the animals, what are we seeing out there in the industry? Guiding us, helping us move through, uh, keeping these animals in the best condition that they possibly can. Merck Animal Health has our territory representatives that are always available to help answer any questions. And it's also very important to work closely with your uh, veterinarian and a nutritionist that knows your operation to help make management decisions. By using proven health practices such as implants and deworming, the Shiro's and other stalker operators like them are ensuring their cattle reach their full potential. Reporting from Oklahoma, I'm Brad Bulla for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen.
Now, for more information on Merck's lineup of cattle health products that can help your farm or ranch meet any challenges, just visit their website, mahcattle.com. Well, still to come here on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll show you how members of the beef industry in South Dakota are giving back to their community. That story and a whole lot more when we return. They're here, they're hungry, and they can't be stopped with ivermectin. Choose Safeguard when you deworm your cattle to take out resistant parasites like brown stomach worm, cuperia, nematodirus, and others. With Safeguard's efficacy, you can kill more resistant worms in your cattle so you don't leave potential on the table. Consult your veterinarian for the diagnosis and treatment of parasitism. Then bite back at safeguardworks.com. And welcome back. Well, here on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we absolutely love to highlight the good work that's being done by cattle producers in and around their communities. Brian Baxter has more on a great event put on by the South Dakota Cattlemen's Foundation to help provide high quality protein to those in need of nutrition. For beef cattle producers in South Dakota, this is the biggest event of the year. It's called the Primetime Gala, and the room in Sioux Falls was packed full for the 10th annual event. Every year, the South Dakota Cattlemen's Foundation puts on the Primetime Gala, and it is our largest event of the year. It's the largest fundraiser for Feeding South Dakota, and the premier event in Sioux Falls that celebrates the work that the producers and ranchers do, and the work that Feeding South Dakota is doing. I think the reason the partnership has been so successful is producers really bought in very early and often because the product that they work so hard to produce and they know the benefits of is exactly the product that Feeding South Dakota was in need of and so it was such a good fit. It's awesome to be here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota again to, to witness one of the premier events all across the country. The Primetime Gala has grown from an idea 11 years ago to now something that has given away in excess of 1.5 million pounds of beef to those that are food challenged. Feeding South Dakota is the state's largest food bank serving all 66 counties statewide. Too often, one of the gaps in the food that Feeding South Dakota supplies to those in need is beef. That's where the partnership with the South Dakota Cattlemen's Foundation has made a huge difference. Proteins like beef are not always donated to us, and so as a food bank, partnerships with people like Cattlemen's Foundation allows us to get protein-rich beef into boxes to help families in need in South Dakota. This is a program that actually uh, looks for a solution, tries to put some beef on the plates of people that don't have the opportunity to buy some really high-quality protein uh, that, that they need. Well, I think as far as the community cause goes, you know, when you talk about food deserts, all those kinds of things, I think one of the things that falls out of that equation first is beef, high quality protein. And so I think it's important to get high quality protein on the plates of folks that really do need it in areas that are underserved in the nutrition department. I think what most of the producers in South Dakota are the most proud of in this project is that the food bank has turned that $2 million into nearly a million and a half pounds of beef for the consumption from people who really need it the most. Over the past 10 years, the Primetime Gala has become more than a fundraising event for cattle producers to attend. It includes a great stake, a live auction, and a chance for producers and the community to connect and build relationships. So what we do is we provide the stake for the banquet tonight. It's cattlemen feeding cattlemen. And then one of the major needs that we've discovered through this journey is that protein is lacking on the food donation side. And the donation that the Gala and the Cattlemen's Foundation provides is used 100% to buy beef. It's become such a fun time to introduce people outside of our industry to producers. And then when they get to the event, they get served a, the best ribeye steak imaginable. They really love participating in the auction that happens that night. There's thousands of dollars worth of auction items. 
And then of course, we tap it off with a great night of country music. So the community that's come together has really contributed to the success of the event. Then the neat part is the, the general public gets to come for our concert and we take the proceeds that we make out of that concert and the proceeds that we make out of the gala and that's what we give for our donation. So for somebody attending the Alabama concert, what better way to uh, help contribute to your community than to get to take in a concert and then have that money go towards providing beef to those that need it so desperately. Growing up in the beef industry, being a producer my whole life, um, it's just a, it's like, I call it prom for the beef industry. We're all here, we get to see customers, neighbors, friends haven't seen you know since last year or maybe years before. And uh, the fact that we're able to be a part of the event and, and help with the donation is, is just a, another blessing. And for the 10th year, the Primetime Gala achieved its primary mission of delivering an evening of great fun and the fundraising needed to keep beef in the mix for those served by Feeding South Dakota. And I would tell the listeners out there, you have the same ability to take an idea, however big and grandiose it is, and work together and make it a reality. So I challenge you. I challenge you to make a difference in your community like I know you can, and spread the message that beef is what's for dinner. Reporting from the Primetime Gala in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, I'm Brian Baxter for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Still to come here on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we have some past Environmental Stewardship Award winners offering some very valuable tips on how to manage your grazing resources. So stay with us, we'll be right back. Are you concerned about the impact government policies could have on your cattle business? One way to make your voice heard in Washington is by joining NCBA. When you join, you'll be part of the nation's oldest and largest national cattle industry organization that has a professional team working in Washington, D.C. on issues that matter to cattle producing families nationwide. Don't stay on the sidelines. Make your voice heard by joining NCBA today at the website ncba.org. Well, good grass management continues to play a very important role in the success of a farmer ranch and even a few small changes to how you graze your pastures can have a huge impact on your bottom line. Cattlemen to Cattlemen reporter Matt Fleck has a look at how a couple of Environmental Stewardship Award program national winners manage their grass resources. Gary and Sue Price put their 77-acre ranch in Texas together piece by piece over four decades. The Prices used a variety of conservation techniques, including rotational grazing of their cattle to convert worn-out pastures and farmland into vibrant, diverse prairie, capable of supporting both cattle and wildlife. What we're doing on our ranch is trying to really mimic what the bison were doing, the wild animals, many years ago. And we do that by rotating our cattle herd through about 45 different pastures. It allows those grasses to have time to rest, and that's really what was going on with the huge herds of bison many, many years ago. They would go through in huge numbers and had the good impact of the hoof action and the manure recycling and the urine, but then, you know, they moved on. Although the Blackleg Ranch in North Dakota has been around longer, since 1882, they follow many of the same management principles. The Doan family pays close attention to soil health, and rotational grazing helps generate greater forage production while limiting erosion and reducing costs. 
When we got into it, and I, I started very slow. I just took one big pasture and divided it twice. And then I observed and I'm like, wow, this looks like it made a difference. And now we've got a hundred and some pastures and we're moving cattle every one to seven days. And we've seen tremendous improvement. Our profitability, which is one of our big goals, bring profitability back to the ranch is going like that. Improving grass on land that's already a part of the operation is a proven way to make a cattle operation more efficient and profitable. Jerry believes producers who are aiming to implement a rotational grazing plan need to stay flexible, learn all they can, and be willing to make step-by-step -step changes to reach their goals. I always say start slow, take baby steps. That's what I did. You can't jump from this side of the fence to there in one day and if you do you'll have a wreck first off your mind isn't in the right place half the battle in the holistic management or grazing management is getting your mind different great granddad did it that way grandpa did it that way dad did it that way and by god i'll do it that way that's all fine and good but you so you've got to get your mind right so start slow ask for help and then see where it goes for you an effective grazing plan requires detailed record keeping about the history and condition of pastures. This information helps guide producers in making informed decisions regarding grazing strategies, pasture improvements, and resource allocation. Well, you need to have a plan and you need to keep good records of when you've been in those pastures and how quick you've made the rotations. And all that's going to vary depending on all of the circumstances with the weather that not only you have, but what, what are the predictions going forward? What are you going to be doing six weeks from now? What are the grass productions going to look like in those pastures as you go forward? Experienced ranchers like Gary and Jerry also learn to build drought management provisions into their grazing plan so they can quickly adapt to changing forage conditions. With that, you've always got to have a drought management plan of when you're going to be destocking and how you're going to do that, what class of cattle you would destock first. You know, we went been through two really extreme drought years. That changed everything. But in our case, our grazing management built resilience into the grassland we were able to get through those without selling one cow like a lot of people. At some point, even the best management, you're going to have some problems. But you will build resilience in that get you through some of those years, and that's a big benefit to us. Keeping a close eye on the height and health of the grass in each pasture is critical. And done correctly, rotational grazing improves the quality and diversity of the grass available to cattle. In turn, these nationally recognized cattle producers know firsthand that cattle act as a valuable tool for soil and grass improvements. If you take the cattle off the land, you will desertify the land and we'll all starve to death. I don't think the land would be healthier without grazing at all, right the opposite. We've put some exclosures on the ranch uh, in partnership with NRCS. They've been out now about 11 years. In the exclosures, that gr grass is actually dying because it lacks the hoof action, it lacks the nutrient recycling that goes on with the manure and the urine, all of that. So it's very, very important, you know, that the impact of grazing has on the land. The experience of these two ranchers in vastly different regions of the country demonstrates that a well-designed grazing plan leads to more forage and a healthier landscape. And that creates the opportunity for a more profitable cattle business that's sustainable across generations. I'm Matt Fleck for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Now the National Cattlemen's Beef Association continues to offer lots of ways to learn about new production and management techniques that can really help improve your grazing management. To find out more about all of these great educational programs that are available, visit ncba.org and just click on the Producers tab at the top of the page. We'll be back to wrap up our show right after this, so please stay with us. From bailing to loader work and property maintenance, John Deere 5 Series tractors can do it all. Run heavier implements with up to 130 horsepower. Handle any loader work. Easily stack bales with improved visibility. Work precisely and confidently with precision ag technologies. And a variety of cab and transmission options to fit your needs and your budget. More choices, 
more versatility, more confidence. Ask your John Deere dealer about 5 Series tractors. Do you want to rewatch an episode of Cattleman to Cattleman or even catch up on anything you might have missed? Then just visit our YouTube page. You'll find replays of all of our shows filled with lots of educational segments and producer profiles from across the country. So check us out on YouTube. Well, we're wrapping up this week's show with legacy photos. Of course, these are shots submitted by our viewers of daily life on the farmer ranch. So let's take a look. We'd like to feature your photos here on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, and you can send us your pictures through the Cattlemen to Cattlemen Facebook page or emailing them to c2c at beef.org. Send them our way so we can maybe use them on a future episode. Well, that's going to do it for this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you again next week right here on RFD TV.